When you think of a submarine, what do you picture? The warships of World War I and II? Huge metal cylinders equipped with sonar and torpedoes? If you're from Connecticut, maybe you're thinking of Groton, nicknamed the submarine capital of the world, where it houses the New London Naval Submarine Base. However, located just half an hour away, there's a submarine that looks entirely different from these industrial creations. The Connecticut River Museum, located along the Connecticut River in Essex, houses an exhibit on the first submarine ever used in warfare, named the Turtle after its oblong shape. Built in 1775, this one-man submarine only had a half an hour long air supply once it was submerged. So how did this little submarine grow to become impactful enough to have multiple recreations and a permanent exhibit here in the museum? Let's dive in deeper to find out. In 1776, a year after the start of the Revolutionary War, American forces were trying desperately to hold off the British. However, this was no easy task. The 13 colonies were fighting against an empire, one with the most powerful navy in the world. The Royal Navy set up a blockade of New York Harbor, possibly numbering over 300 ships. A blockade of this size prevents trade of any goods by sea, which can cause a community to diminish by preventing the trade of food. This blockade was headed by the Eagle, a 64-gun warship similar to the ship pictured on the right. So who did the Americans go to to end this blockade? Perhaps the French, or a spy from the British, or even a renowned boatsman. Instead, they turned to David Bushnell, a Yale graduate and farmer with no boating experience. David Bushnell was born on August 30th, 1740, on a farm near Saybrook. In 1771, Bushnell began studying at Yale, where he was experimenting with how to explode gunpowder underwater. Before the Revolutionary War began, Bushnell was already thinking about how to construct his submarine vessel. While the location and condition of the original turtle is currently unknown, Bushnell wrote a comprehensive description of the vessel in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, which was published in 1799, allowing us to understand how his invention worked. The turtle had many innovative mechanical elements to enable it to complete its goal, to travel underwater and attach an underwater mine to the hull of an enemy ship, and then escape before the explosion. The Americans believed the mine was capable of taking down the eagle and ending the blockade. The turtle got its name after its unique shape, which is like two turtle shells fit together with a metal hatch on top. They are made to fit each other exactly, and covered in tar to make sure it was watertight. Attached to the side was a powder keg mine, made of two pieces of hollowed out oak. The mine was attached to a rope, which connected it to a large screw. This screw was designed to dig into the hull of a ship. Then, when the mine was released from the turtle, it would stay attached to the ship and would activate a timing device invented by clockmaker and silversmith Phineas Pratt. The device could be set for up to 12 hours, giving the submarine plenty of time to escape. The operator had to be able to keep a level head. In his novel, Attack of the Turtle, Drew Carlson helps his readers imagine what being inside the one-man submarine might have been like. What was I supposed to do next? Submerge the submarine and get under the eagle. I pulled the hatch down and sat. My heart was pounding and my right leg was twitching wildly. Leg, what is wrong with you? I hissed. In exasperation, I grabbed it with both hands and forced it down on the ballast intake valve. In a moment, I was descending into the inky darkness. Down I dropped, much faster than I'd anticipated. In fact, the turtle was sinking like a rock. I panicked and frantically clawed the wooden walls. I had to get out, I had to get out. If I didn't, the turtle would get stuck in the mud at the bottom of the harbor, and I'd die. I eased off the intake valve, reached over to the ballast pumps, and began pumping water out. Then I reached up and began cranking the upper oars. The turtle stopped sinking, hung motionless for a moment, then began to rise. How long had I been underwater, I wondered. How much air was left? Did I still have time to attach the bomb? The turtle's operator lowered himself through the hatch at the top of the submarine and would sit on a wooden bench, which doubled as support to ensure the turtle would not collapse under the water pressure it faced at lower depths. The vessel was designed so that the operator would not have to turn his body and could navigate it in nearly pitch-black darkness. 
However, the operator had to be just as good as multitasking in order to use the many foot pedals and cranks necessary for steering, adjusting depth, propelling forward, and attaching the mine to the hull of the enemy ship. When he wished to descend, the operator would have to use his foot to push down on a brass valve, letting water into the submarine to increase its weight. When he wanted to rise, he could operate two pumps with his hands to remove the water. This alone would take both hands and a foot, but that still leaves the matter of moving forwards, backwards, and side to side. For this, the operator would turn an oar at the top of the vessel with his hands. Turning the attached screw one way would move forwards, and the other backwards. It could be used with feet or hands. There was also a rudder on the submarine for steering and moving forwards, which was operated with the right hand. Steering the turtle would require both concentration and hand-eye coordination. It would be like trying to pat your head and rub your stomach, while also having limited air supply, almost no light, and a barrel of gunpowder and enemy ships only feet away. Focusing on moving the turtle would have been hard enough on its own, but the operator also had to know where he was and what direction he was meant to go. For this, Bushnell included two key pieces of technology which are still used in modern subs. First, he created a barometer. This glass tube held a cork and suspended it in water. It would move in relation to the depth of the submarine. He also included a compass. In order to see these key components, they were marked with a phosphorescent called Foxfire, which glowed in the dark. This was the operator's only source of light while underwater. A candle was tested, but it used too much oxygen to be efficient. The turtle also included safety measures. It had special vents which would take in air immediately once the turtle rose to the surface. The operator could also release some of the lead ballast in an emergency, which would allow the turtle to instantly surface. Even with these safety measures, operating the turtle was risky. Not only did the operator have to worry about the simple navigation, but he would also be approaching enemy ships. Now, let's learn about what happened on the turtle's first mission. On September 6th, Edgesler Lee climbed into the turtle through the hatch at the top. Then he began rowing furiously. The turtle only moved a few miles an hour, so he had to act quick. Guided by the light of the Foxfire compass, he moved quickly to try to catch up to the eagle. Guided by his Foxfire compass, Ezra Lee kept on paddling until he got close to the turtle. When he tried to submerge for the first time, he ended up getting carried away under the ship by the currents. He was able to return, and this time, he got so close to the ship that he could hear the soldiers talking on the eagle above him. He used the pump on the floor to descend again, and began to go underneath the ship. Ezra got right next to the ship and began operating the screw. To his surprise, the submarine bounced right off of the eagle. Bushnell had been more than confident that the turtle would be able to penetrate the hull, even if it had been lined with copper. Bushnell believed that Ezra tried to screw into the iron hinges which attached the rudder to the ship. Ezra tried again, but with no luck. On his third try, he bounced off the side of the ship and was swept away by the currents. This movement, coupled with the compass getting out of line, disoriented Ezra enough that he could not get back to the ship. He knew the sun would be rising soon, and he needed to leave before being spotted. One of the times Ezra Lee returned to the surface, he was spotted. He continued to move as fast as possible, but he knew he wouldn't be able to make it too far. In a last-ditch effort, he released the bomb from the turtle. He hoped that this would make him a little bit faster. And even if he did get captured, he figured the bomb would still go off and the turtle would not be taken by the British. Luckily for him, Ezra made it back to Bushnell and his allies. Less than an hour later, the mine went off. While it didn't cause any serious damage, the unexpected explosion certainly worried the fleet of ships. You may have noticed that throughout this video, many images of the turtle look different from each other. This is because on October 9th, when the turtle was in transport on a small ship, the ship was attacked. The turtle was said to have sank, but been recovered. Since then, the turtle's status and whereabouts are still unknown. 
Since the turtle's disappearance, there have been multiple recreations of the vessel. In 1976, Joseph Leary and Fred Fries successfully launched their replica, celebrating the turtle's 200-year anniversary. The event drew large crowds who watched in awe as a one-man sub was lowered into the water, unlike the turtle's launches, which were kept secret. The two spent long hours researching the vessel's history and trying to create the most accurate representation possible. They even funded it themselves, just like Bushnell had. Now it is housed in the Connecticut River Museum Boathouse. From 2003 to 2007, Fred Fries teamed up with Roy Manston and the Naval Underwater Warfare Center to create the Old Saybrook High School Turtle Project, where students worked to create their own one-man submarine, which was also successfully launched. Come visit us here at the Connecticut River Museum to learn more about the turtle, the Connecticut River, and all of its history.